I started out as a veterinarian and I was blessed in, in working with some of the biggest zoos and some big animal populations. And one of my favorite stories was the uh, bears around the world. They were dying of liver cancer all over the world. It didn't matter if they were a polar bear, a black bear, a sun bear, a Kodiak bear. It didn't matter what species they were and it didn't matter what zoo or what country they came from. They're all dying of liver cancer. And Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual Omaha Wild Kingdom show, I had worked with him and he said, okay, well, I was going to start this big project of, uh, for the National Institutes of Health doing autopsies. It was 1967 and just came back from Africa. And Perkins gave me this list. He says, here's a list of things that I personally want you to do while you're doing this project for the NIH. And I looked at it and the first thing on the list was, why are all the bears, regardless of species, all over the world dying from liver cancer? And he says, the biologists say it's a genetic thing. Uh, what do you think? And he said, well, it's certainly not a genetic thing if every species all over the world of bears uh, are dying of liver cancer. I said, but I think I know what it is. He says, well, you haven't even seen any of the slides, nothing. Well, there is a particular fungus that actually causes uh, liver cancer. It's called aflatoxin. It's very common in peanuts, and most bears sell peanuts at the zoos so people can throw them to the bears, you know, so they can uh, stand up and they take pictures of them waving at the crowd to get attention so they can get the peanut. So let's culture some of these peanuts from around these zoos around the world. And we can also, if you take a ultraviolet light and go in the dark and go to these peanuts in the, in the barrel or the drum or the basket and put that ultraviolet light on it, if there's this aflatoxin in there that causes the liver cancer, it'll glow in the night. It'll glow, okay, like a firefly. And sure enough, in all the zoos around the world, the peanuts they were feeding the bears had aflatoxin, they're all glowing. And we were able to uh, make sure that all the zoos, when they would get peanuts to feed the animals in the zoo, they would put that ultraviolet light on and make sure that none with aflatoxins came in there. And we stopped the liver cancer epidemic in the bears around the world. One of the other things that would go on with that was the old bread, of course, was a thing they could buy cheaply. And you know, one loaf of bread would be 1,500 calories. And it was um, uh, moldy bread, you know, from the various bread companies would sell them to the zoos and so forth. And of course, we'd put that ultraviolet light on them. The bread would light up uh, because of the mold on the bread were the cousins to the mold on the peanuts. And they would also produce aflatoxins. So they had to give up the bread as well as the peanuts. Uh, so it was quite the story. And it made the front pages and the magazines and this and the other. And of course, it's in the book Epigenetics, it's in the book uh, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, it's, it's uh, in the book uh, Rare Has Been, Been Cures, because it was a big story. And of course, the same thing is true for people. It'd be very interesting to find out what the percentage of liver cancer is on homeless people that get old bread, okay, given to them, which has mold on it, and they throw away the two or three slices of, of bread that have the mold on it, but that aflatoxin has seeped into all the other. I want to know what the rate of liver cancer is on the homeless people compared with middle class people who have a job and only buy fresh bread that doesn't have mold on it. That'd be very interesting. Uh, we actually switched the bears to dog food, dry dog food. We just had to get dry dog food that didn't have any gluten in it. And so we switched them to dry dog food. And remember, that was in 1967. We ended the, the bear liver cancer epidemic. And of course, it's one of those things where uh, I'm very, very proud of that. It's as rare that uh, one person's experience added to telephones and letters and we didn't have emails and stuff like that back then. If they did, I didn't know it. And so it was all done by letters and phone calls. And just think of that. We were able to, and the best biologists in the world hadn't figured it out. And we're dealing with liver cancer and polar bears, Kodiak bears, black bears, sun bears, brown bears, uh, every kind of bear you can think of, pandas because they're all being treated the same diet-wise. And so it was quite the, uh, the project. The results were stunning, and I was very, very proud of that. So I was just uh, blessed and will give the good Lord all the credit. And I was just uh, so happy and proud that I was the instrument to make the good things happen. Well, one of the great rare and endangered species, of course, is the giant panda. And one of the reasons why it was rare and endangered in captivity in the zoos goes back to the beginning of of zoos, you know, hundreds of years ago, maybe even a thousand years ago in the days of the Roman Empire. But people say, well, pandas never produce babies in zoos. And it's because, you know, they're so sensitive and people are looking at them in the zoo and it's just, it's, well, what are you feeding them? Well, we're giving them bamboo just like they live on in the wild. And so I kind of looked it up and I came back and said, well, you know, the pandas eat more than bamboo. They, they eat bamboo, they eat rats, they catch birds, they eat eggs. 
Uh, they eat potatoes. I mean, they're kind of like a bear. They're omnivorous. They eat a lot of stuff. Uh, they eat a lot of little vertebrates that they can catch, including mice and squirrels and rabbits and all kinds of things. And so uh, their diet is a lot more complicated than just giving them bamboo. So again, we began to, just like the bears, we began to give them uh, dog food. And we kind of mix it up, dry dog food and the canned dog food. And within a year's time, all the zoos in Europe and all the zoos in North America are having babies. So again, like the bear thing, the liver cancer, the pandas breeding in captivity are based on just simple stuff that, again, the average person doesn't think about. You know, they take from lack of experience and they go read, well, uh, pandas live in the, in the bamboo forest and, and that's what they eat okay and so they went out of their way and they did everything they could to get fresh bamboo sprouts for for the pandas but then it, it wasn't enough didn't have enough nutrition to support um, conception and pregnancy so again we saved a class of animals uh, based on just proper nutrition well now the pandas are uh, almost a burden in the zoos because they all have babies and so they do have panda reserves in china which we do cooperate and the pandas get shipped to places where they don't have them in zoos and also uh, where they have the panda reserves in China. So the pandas are not endangered anymore because we've found how to make sure that they all have babies. At, at the Chicago Aquarium, the porpoises and dolphins were all having problems and dying of heart failure and this, that, and the other. And um, it comes down to there is a certain kind of fish that has thiaminase in it. Thiaminase is, a, is an enzyme that destroys vitamin B1, thiamine. And thiamine deficiency causes congestive heart failure. And so, you know, we're talking about um, sardines and things like that. And these small fish, uh, which were easy for zoos to get and keep in the freezer, and the porpoises and dolphins loved them, and everybody was happy. And so uh, we began to uh, switch to different types of fish that did not have those thiaminase enzymes. We gave them the 90 cents of nutrients, which all vertebrates need, including porpoises and dolphins. And we gave them extra of the thiamine, just in case some thiaminase got in there. And we ended all the congestive heart failure deaths in the porpoises in captivity. But why is this happening? Well, it, it turns out for years and years and years and years that aquariums had trouble in keeping dolphins alive for long periods of time, particularly the ones that used those fish that had the thiaminase enzyme in the tissues. And nobody made that connection. Well, you have to appreciate, by the time that I got there, I'd already done 20,000 autopsies and um, 17,000 and change of over 454 species of animals, including dolphins and porpoises and whales and, and so forth. So I was very familiar with um, whales of all sizes and species. And so um, it comes down to my training as a pathologist. And so when you have populations showing the same problem, it's going to be very easy to solve the problem. Now, to a geneticist, say, well, it's a genetic thing. It's in all, all, all the dolphins. Well, no, there's other options here. What are they being fed? What, what do they drink for water? Uh, what, are their, what is the water in the tank being uh, cleaned with and so forth? Are just filters or chemicals or what? And so you have to look at the environment. You have to look at their food. And I have solved so many problems for domestic animals, also for so many animals in captivity, and uh, this includes birth defects and, and um, so forth. So we're very, very proud of that. And basically, the problem was they were just being fed fish. Because again, they would ask a veterinarian, they would ask a doctor, and they'd say, oh, you know, just feed them well, and they'll get everything they need. And trying to keep expenses down, instead of, of uh, giving them the 90 cents of nutrients, they would just give them the whole fish. Well, we're giving them the whole fish. That's what they eat out in the wild. Well, where those fish come from that have the thiaminase enzyme in the tissue, there's no dolphins and whales there in those places, okay? And the people who eat those fish by catching them, you know, the, either a spear or a hook or a net or something, they're eating all kinds of other things. So eating two the, three of those little fish twice a week is, is not a problem. But if they only ate those fish three times a day as their only meal, they'd have a problem with congestive heart failure just like the dolphins. When it comes to other animals, people always ask me, okay, what about big vertebrates, you know, like cattle and horses and, and so forth? If they were having congestive heart failure, that would mean they're either getting some thiaminase enzyme somewhere or they're getting fed food that didn't make those vitamins, okay? 
thiamine. And so thiamine is actually made by grain. Okay, well grain has its hazards because of the gluten in it. And so it's one of those things where, where they say, well eat whole grains, you get vitamins. Well yeah, you do, especially in the brand, but that's where most of the gluten is. And so that's not my first choice as a source of thiamine, okay. Uh, especially in domestic livestock where they have no health insurance for the animals. We can send them to a cardiologist, they get congestive heart failure, no. You give them all 90 essential nutrients, um, you give them a trace mineral salt block, and the need for medical care or veterinary care of livestock, such as, again, as cattle and horses and sheep and, and pigs and goats and poultry, chickens and turkeys and things, is almost zero because you're getting all these nutrients in uh, in their supplement programs. And farmers do this without the need to go to a veterinarian. This is either what they learn in agricultural school or the feed salesmen that go through those communities, they'll, ha they'll stop at every farm. They'll say, hey, you know, you can, you know, reduce a lot of these health problems. Uh, your calves will be better off and, and not have all these problems by giving the mothers these vitamins and minerals and they come through the milk and you know, they, when the calves start eating whole foods, they need their own supply and so forth. And this is one of the reasons why I knew we could really take veterinary nutritional supplement programs and devise a similar program for humans because all vertebrates require the same nutrients and all vertebrates get the same diseases from the same deficiencies. So why wouldn't the proce processes we did with animals work on humans and sure enough it worked. One of the areas, one of the great areas uh, that I learned from the animal industry and carry it over into human life is that birth defects were fairly rare in um, livestock, cattle and sheep and horses and pigs and stuff like that. They occurred, but they occurred randomly. Um, maybe two farms in a county in Missouri might have this problem because those defects were caused by a mineral deficiency and they didn't have those minerals in the soil there and they weren't supplementing in any particular way with that mineral and that's why they had the birth defects and the brothers and sisters of those same animals and five farms over didn't have any problems. And so the first one I ran into was really spectacular. I had um, graduated from veterinary school. I was kind of halfway through my degree in pathology from the University of Missouri. I went to Iowa State to finish it off. Marlon Perkins, before I got finished, he sent me to Africa to work on the White Rhino Conservation Project. And two years into that, he had me come back because he got this grant uh, based on one of my research projects. 25 million dollars to do those autopsies. One of the places I was working was at the Yerkes Primate Center in Atlanta, Georgia. These were the big NASA monkey colonies were and I was a veterinarian and a pathologist there and I was also working on human pathology at Grady Memorial Hospital uh, in Atlanta and I ran into the first non-human case of cystic fibrosis, supposed to be the classic example of a genetically transmitted disease in humans, cystic fibrosis. And I did my little review here, and it turns out I was able to get permission to do biopsies of the other 24 baby monkeys in the colony, all of whom had different mothers and fathers. There was 25 pairs of monkeys. Every one of them had babies at the same time. They kind of controlled the breeding dates, so they're all going to babies are going to be born about the same time. And the first one that died, I got, and classic cystic fibrosis. I sent tissue around and to experts, and they said, "Oh, this is a classic example of cystic fibrosis." And I said, "Well, this happens to be from a monkey." What? you found the first non-human case of cystic fibrosis. So everybody was excited. And I was in every newspaper. I was in every newspaper every day for three months. What a wonderful thing this was. And finally the scientist said, okay, Wallach, how long do you think it'll take with breeding of that one monkey and taking genes and doing artificial insemination and all this kind of stuff? Because uh, we'll be able to get 100 baby monkeys to, to really do some research on cystic fibrosis. And I said, well, I can do better than that. I can give you 1,000 baby monkeys in six months because it's not a genetic disease, it's actually a nutritional deficiency of a single nutrient and um, I can reproduce as many monkeys as you want. And they immediately fired me <laughs> because they believed it was a genetic disease and I was sniffing glue and I was way off in the deep end and this, that and the other. But I had um, gotten permission to do biopsies of these other 24 baby monkeys. Well guess what, they all had cystic fibrosis even though they had different brothers or mothers and fathers, they were not genetically related to each other other than they were monkeys but they weren't cousins or anything like that because the monkeys were from all over, all over India, not just one little county or anything. And so I knew that it wasn't genetic. And so I started really studying cystic fibrosis hard in people 
And sure enough, it's a very, very simple disease, easy to prevent. It's a deficiency really of two nutrients. One deficiency causes the pancreas and the liver disease. The other nutrition deficiency causes the respiratory problems, which are classic, usually the terminal event uh, of kids with cystic fibrosis. So to make a long story short, I was able to come up with a program for that and went around the world and just call, you know, gave lectures and so forth and came up with programs. And so today, um, these kids can live to be in their 70s and 80s and 90s. Back then, their, the average lifespan of these kids with cystic fibrosis was five to seven. They never lived past 12. And um, uh, some of these places were the Amish, of course, the colonies that had a high rate of cystic fibrosis. They also had a high rate of muscular dystrophy. Well, muscular dystrophy is very common in animals. It's a, called white muscle disease in animals because when you butcher them, instead of having red muscle, like, you know, like a steak, raw steak is a red, okay, this would be white or yellow, okay, and they call it white muscle disease. Well, it's just muscular dystrophy in animals. They call it uh, white muscle disease in animals and muscular dystrophy in humans. So we began to give the kids in, in the uh, Amish communities that had muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis all 90 cents of nutrients with more of that mineral, and we were actually reversing cystic fibrosis and mustard history within weeks and months. It was like crazy, okay? And so I took several of these um, files from kids that we had reversed their mustard dystrophy with and gave them to Jerry Lewis two years before he died. And um, I said, Jerry, this is for you. We have found the cause prevention and the ability to reverse mustard dystrophy, okay, using some animal studies, giving these kids these nutrients and it turns out that mustard dystrophy is a nutritional deficiency. They can be born with it because mom's deficient, or they can be born normal, but because they have a gluten intolerance and can't absorb it, if they're supplementing, they, they can get mustard dystrophy. But it's a totally reversible and preventable disease. He got so excited, he took those records to the Mustard Dystrophy Association. Remember, he was doing a telethon for 20 years, raising money for research and genetics and all that kind of stuff at mustard dystrophy. And they fired Jerry Lewis and shut down the telethon. That's why I haven't heard anything about muscular dystrophy or cystic fibrosis in the last 10, 12, 15 years. There aren't any cases anymore. Every baby formula, by law now, has to have this nutrient in it. We're also able to end sudden death syndrome, crib death. Okay, the, the failed theory was the crib death was caused by mothers laying on the babies in the crib. Well, it turns out that only 2% of the babies who die of crib death are in bed with their mothers when they die. Well, they suffocate from the sheets and blankets. Well, I redid a lot of those baby deaths uh, as far as uh, autopsies, and none of them suffocated. They all died from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart disease, which is a deficiency of a single nutrient, the same nutrient deficiency that kills young athletes, 25,000 a year in America under the age of 20. I've done 1,700 autopsies on kids that have died of that. The English is in three languages. The English version is in uh, the Journal of Trace Element Research. It's also in Mandarin and Cantonese. But at any rate, um, through federal court rulings that went in our behalf, because we've been after them for years and years and years, we were putting what we call a kid's toddy. It was a liquid multiple. We would have people put in their formulas because we knew they didn't have that nutrient in there. And um, sure enough, the rate of crib death was slowly going down. But we got this ruling April 16th, 2013, a federal court, which required all manufacturers of baby formulas to put that nutrient in baby formulas within three months, a cover story, front page, front page, the Charlotte Observer, which is the big page in Charlotte, North Carolina, big newspaper in Charlotte, Car North Carolina, just like New York Times in New York. They said, we don't know why, but crib death has vanished in the state of North Carolina. Three months later, Missouri said the same thing. Three months later, all states said, we don't know why, but the rate of crib death has dropped dramatically by 85 to 95% in our states. That's because baby farmers now had that nutrient in there. The reason why I was dropping slowly over the years before the court ruled to put that in baby formulas, we had our kids toddy and people would come to our lectures as being interviewed on TV and radio and so forth and people knew to get that kids toddy and put it in their baby formulas to prevent sudden infant death syndrome, crib death, and also muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis. So we're very, very proud of all that. We had to sue the courts and everything because we were getting rulings ordering us to stop saying that we could prevent and reverse uh, certain childhood diseases and adult diseases using vitamins and minerals. Because doctors and hospitals and 
uh, insurance companies and people who were geneticists would go to the courts and say, this guy's a veterinarian. He wasn't even a doctor yet. What are we talking about here? He's a veterinarian. And he's saying all these diseases we know of is a fact. And I mean, you know, we got all these 10 professors from the university who say it's a genetic disease, and he's saying it's just a simple nutritional deficiency. And, and, you know, we don't want him to defraud all these people. And so I was able to prove to the courts that I was correct by having the records from the animal showing that the same disease under the microscope because their experts couldn't tell whether it was from an animal or a human. Well, what would you say this is? Oh, that's muscular dystrophy. What would you say this is muscular dystrophy? Which one is an animal and which one is a human? Uh, okay, well, they couldn't because muscle is muscle under the microscope. So those are the sort of things that we were able to do over the years. And, and, and mostly it was legal stuff, okay? Because we knew we had the prevention, we knew we had the reversal, uh, we knew it, it was diet and lack of nutrients. Uh, we knew from the animal studies and soil studies, I also have a degree in agriculture, uh, nutritional minerals do not occur in a uniform blanket around the crust of the earth. They occur in veins like chocolate and chocolate with ice cream. Okay, that's why some places in the world people live to be 200. Some places in the world people only live to be 40. They could be first cousins. And that's because the, the nutrients are not found equally. Just like gold mines are not found equally around the world. That's why coal mines are not found equally around the world. Okay, silver is not found equally around the world. Same thing with nutritional minerals. You know, some simple ones like iron and zinc and stuff like that, but also some very exotic ones <clears throat> are not found equally around the world. The places where people live the longest are third world cultures. They don't have hospitals. I think this is the thing that, that got the judges the most. Uh, the people who lived the longest in the world were from third world cultures. The Hunzas around the Giltar Glacier in between Pakistan and China they're the longest of people in the world. They're not in the top 19 out of the top 20 longevity cultures on earth. They're third world. They have no doctors, no medical doctors from a medical school. They have no pharmaceuticals. They have no hospitals. And they had absolutely, they didn't have any surgery and no, absolutely they didn't have any health insurance. And yet they had 40 times 100 olds we Americans do. They had 100 old per 250 of their population according to the United Nations, not me. And we only have one per 10,000 with all the medicine we have. And of course, right now, the Center for Disease Control in 2004 came out and said, uh-oh, our kids will be the first generation of Americans that do not live as long as their parents. That's, that's a horrible failure of the medical system. If our kids are going to be the first generation of Americans that do not live as long as their parents, that's a horrible, horrible failure of the medical system. We have a lot of um, very, very talented uh, lawyers and athletes and pastors and even now we're getting people who are in the academic field who know we're quite correct. I've written so many scientific papers or in medical journals and scientific journals. Uh, we were given awards by the United Nations and all kinds of stuff. So it's, um, which I say, they may not like the fact that there, it's being shown that a lot of their uh, beliefs and, and theories are incorrect. Okay, they don't like being told that. They continue to profess their false theories because, uh, you know, I can only sue, I only can afford to sue so many people. Uh, my priority was the birth defects in kids, and so I was uh, so happy to get that nutrient put into baby formulas. We were able to essentially eliminate syndrome death syndrome, muscular dystrophy, and cystic fibrosis. Uh, we did get qualified health claims over um, omega 3s we were able to show that omega-3 deficiencies actually caused um, uh, coronary thrombosis, blood clots in coronary arteries, thrombotic stroke, a blood clot in the brain, pulmonary embolism, blood clot in the lung, deep vein thrombosis in the legs. These are all caused by omega-3 deficiencies. And also, uh, those deficiencies could also result in asthma and that kind of stuff. And so, um, it, it's hard to out-theorize 32,000 autopsies, okay, and all my projects have done about 32,000 autopsies, they're all published, and so it's unimpeachable information, and so when you do 1,700 autopsies on kids under the age of 10 that have died of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart disease, and you come up with the nutrients that's missing, 35% of those 1,700 had cystic fibrosis, 100% had muscular dystrophy, and 200 of them under the age of one years old had syndrome death syndrome. And so it's one of those things where it's um, unimpeachable evidence, it's published, 
and respected journals. And so the doctors still pursue their theories because that's how they make their living. And that's why our children will be the first generation of Americans that do not live as long as their parents. Our animals are living longer and longer and longer and healthier. The cost to farmers of, of health care for livestock before they ship in the market is almost zero because um, they give them the nutrients. In 1958, I started out my academic career in agriculture, went to the uh, Department of Agriculture, University of Missouri, um, and two years into that, I applied for and got into veterinary school, and I kind of worked my way through veterinary school, working in the pathology department as a student assistant, and they you know, gave me a couple hundred bucks a month, plus I got some credits uh, towards a, a degree, if I ever wanted to do that, I got credits towards a, a university degree in pathology. And in, in December of 1961, I was two years into my pathology training, six months before I got my degree in agriculture, and a couple years before I got my degree in veterinary medicine, in wrestling and at the University of Missouri, okay, uh, on their team. So I was a busy boy, and um, everybody is uh, out for Christmas vacation. Okay, because it's December. I was the new guy on the block in the pathology department, so all, all the advanced students and the professors were gone. And I ran into the first mass die off in America from pollution. I'm sure it had happened before, but nobody paid attention to it. Um, they brought me 50 lambs. Uh, these were feeder lambs. They were six months old. They were just two weeks from going to market. They were part of a, a flock of 500 lambs. All 500 died in one night. So they brought me 50. Opened up the first one, and as the blood came down over the wool, because they had two inches of wool, they were going to shear them and then send them off to market. And of course, they all died in that one night. Well, the blood came out of that lamb, and it looked like chocolate milk instead of blood, which is called methemoglobin. It's caused by nitrate poisoning. And so I said, okay, it's gotten some nitrates in the drinking water or the hay or something. So I just marked that down. And then I got up into the neck of that first one, and the thyroid lobes... And a six-month-old lamb would be the size of a almond, maybe half inch long, quarter inch wide, maybe a couple of millimeters thick. Well, these thyroid lobes, the two lobes in this lamb, were like big plums, a hundred times bigger than they were supposed to be. So I knew the nitrates had been there a long chronic time because you get goiter from chronic low-grade nitrate poisoning. The question was, why did the 500 die in one night? Because if you have a flock of lambs, they're six months old and they got goiter, you might have one die. And if you let them live, maybe in a month or two, another two will die or something like that. All of them are not going to die in one night. That's not typical of a thyroid issue. And so I checked with a farmer and his granddaughter was doing a high-low temperature um, readings for her 4-H project for three months before they all died and then a couple weeks afterwards. And it turns out that the, uh, the temperature in central Missouri in the wintertime can be very high. It could be in the 80s if the wind is coming up from the Gulf up the Mississippi River. It's coming down the Mississippi River from uh, Minnesota or Wisconsin or Michigan. It can be 19 degrees below zero. It turns out on the night they all died, the temperature dropped to 19. They all died of hypothermia okay, because their thyroids weren't working, able to maintain their body temperature. And so I got it all ready for publication. And when the professors and everybody came back from the Christmas vacation, it's 1961, I'm 21 years old. And um, I said, okay, here, I got this, this, and this. This is, it's all ready for publication. May I be a co-author on it? He says, well, we didn't do anything. It's all yours. I said, well, I'm talking about protocol here. I'm a, I'm a student. He said, no, no, you did the whole thing. You figured out this is yours. I said, wow, thank you, sir. So that was my first solo publication. I was a sole author on it. And I submitted it to veterinary journals and got it published. And um, gave co I was so excited, I gave copies to everybody. And I gave one copy to Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual Omaha Law Kingdom show, who I'd worked with as a kid before I went to the university, all through high school and summer times during the university. And he got a $25 million grant from the National Institute of Health, from NIH. He got a $25 million grant to study pollution and uh, deaths in zoo animals and pollution and deaths in humans living around the big zoos, kind of looking for the canary in the mine um, sort of thing, where the, there's bound to be a species of animals in a zoo that was sensitive to the same pollutants as humans. And if they were to die, we knew to evacuate the cities. That was the whole purpose of that project. And so that was my 
my first autopsies by myself, and it was my first big project. I, I actually uh, got it published, and it resulted in a $25 million grant from NIH. So I'm very, very proud of that and thankful to Marlon Perkins. He recognized the value of that thing. I didn't re recognize the entire value of it, but he did. He said, oh my gosh, and he uh, used that to apply for the $25 million grant to do that autopsy study in the big zoos around the United States and North America and Canada and um, uh, Mexico. And uh, that's led to me working all over the world. That one $25 million project, I did 20,000 autopsies, 17,000 and some change of over 454 species of zoo animals and 3,000 people who lived around the zoo. <clears throat> what I found out was there was no deaths in the zoos, there was no deaths in people living around the zoos from pollution. That was all kind of a, a fake theory. Okay, there was no deaths from pollution. And I also found out there was no genetically transmitted diseases. And that began the, this long career. Before the NIH, NIH study, um, I think probably, I would say, I had done probably a thousand autopsies, you know, you know, a couple of dozen humans. The rest were very species, mostly domestic animals, a few exotic, you know, llamas and farm animals like that, and geese, and sometimes they bring me uh, 25 turkeys, and I'd have to do autopsies in 25 dirt turkeys um, because they had some dying and stuff, and had to figure out why they were dying. Of course, I took them home and ate them. I was a poor student. <laughs> um, in the pathology department, there's a team. You give them the tissues, a little bottle of formaldehyde, and they take the tissue and make slides out of them. And um, also, you take you know, anything you want to culture for bacteria, viruses, or fungus, you take swabs out of it, and sterile swabs, and put them in a test tube, and give them to the lab, and they will grow it, and tell you what they grow. But I knew how to do all that kind of stuff. But you can't do all of it. There's just, it's too much. So you have a team. You have um, uh, people who work in the lab, some that make the slides, you know, for looking under the microscope, some that work uh, with blood test, some that work with hair analysis, some that work with um, microbiology, and you're growing bugs. Some deal with parasitology. Um, which some you can see, uh, uh, depending on which parasites they are, uh, either in blood slides or like malaria and things like that, or trypanosomes uh, in, the, in the blood. But uh, when it comes to worms in the intestines, you usually see them because, you know, you get a, a round worm, 8, 10, 12 inches long in a llama or a human, that kind of thing. And so some of those things you could report and record. And just to know what species there are, we'd put them in a bottle of alcohol and give them to the lab and they'd find out, you know, if they got them here locally in the United States or they got them in Colombia or, you know, where, where those worms came from. So it's all very important information. And so I had access to all that from the universities and, and uh, National Institutes of Health and Yerkes Primate Centers. And, and of course, when I did that 1,700 autopsies, that project was in Qishan, China. And uh, Milan, Dr. Milan, my wife, she's a medical doctor from China. She and her parents had tremendous connections in China. So she was able to get permission for me to do 2,000 autopsies of kids in Qishan, China. They're all dying from this heart attack, okay, and they're all dying from that deficiency, that one nutrient. And I knew that same nutrient deficiency caused cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, and crib death. And so I figured, well, they're all arguing with me whether it's a genetic disease or not, or the mothers are suffocating the babies and so what I did was ask her if she could get me to do 2,000 autopsies if I could find 10 cystic fibrosis kids that were supposed to be of European people you never found cystic fibrosis in, in Chinese or Asians or Japanese or anything like that it was all Europeans so that's why they said it was a genetic disease well when I did those 1,700 autopsies in those Chinese kids in Qishan province 35 percent had cystic fibrosis which the Chinese never paid real attention to that because they didn't have cystic fibrosis. 100% had muscular dystrophy. They died from Kishan disease. They died from that heart attack. But they also had muscular dystrophy. And then 200 of them died from what would have been diagnosed as crib death here in the United States because they were one, one year of age and, and had the, uh, the uh, cardiomyopathy heart attack. And so it was a tremendous project. Of course, I had, when you look at the, the publication, we list the I don't know, it had to be eight or 10. You do 1,700 autopsies in just six weeks. Okay, we had a team that had to make all the slides, 
and the team that would come prepare the bodies and stuff like that. I mean, I wasn't taking the bodies out of the bag and putting them on the table. They would do all that and have that all arranged. So when I came through there, was, uh, my job was just to do the autopsy. I didn't have to do the mechanics of getting the body on the table and taking the body off the table and, and making the slides and all that kind of stuff. They had teams that did all that, and that's where Dr. Milan set all that up. At, yeah, at Yerkes Primate Center, I worked there for two years. So, I mean, I did hundreds of autopsies there. And at the University of Missouri, I did more than that one with where the 50 lambs died. I did over a thousand there over a period of uh, uh, four years. Now it's probably more than that. It's probably more like 4,000 over four years, maybe a thousand. Because in some days I'm doing 50 autopsies. You know, they bring you buckets of chickens and things like that. And, and maybe some laboratory experiment, they'd have a hundred white rats. I want you to do autopsies on, uh, to, you know, to finish out the experiment and that kind of stuff. And so it was, you know, a thousand here, a thousand there, fifty here, uh, one thousand seven hundred there, twenty thousand there. It's uh, it adds up. But very few people have as much experience in doing the the number of species. I think probably I'm the only one that has the experience with the number of species that I've done. Uh, four hundred fifty-four species, maybe probably more than that. But that was that one study I did. Four hundred fifty-four species of animals in that big. 20,000 autopsy study, and uh, 454 species plus humans, so that's 455. And then there were other species. I think probably I've done autopsies in over a thousand species of animals and, and humans, different races of humans, you know, Asians of all kinds, um, black people of all kinds, um, Europeans and white people of all kinds. Uh, Native Americans and so forth, and that's why my thesis is in the Smithsonian Institute. Nobody has done as much as that as me. I'm not probably smarter than anybody else, but nobody has done as more as many autopsies as me with as much variation. Usually, somebody's a, a veterinarian working at a university. They're going to be a veterinary pathologist in the animal colony, and they're dealing for 25 years with white rats and guinea pigs for 25 years. Okay. And so that's what made my material so unique. And when I could find human diseases that were supposed to be genetic in animals like muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis and heart disease and all that kind of stuff, it was, it was very obvious that it wasn't genetic. It was nutritional deficiencies. And, and that's why my thesis is in the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, they put covers, they put hard covers on the thesis and sold it as a, as a textbook. W.B. Saunders published it. Uh, which is the biggest medical um, publishing house in the world, W.B. Saunders, and they published that thesis as a textbook. Uh, the first printing was 30,000. The second printing was 30,000. I think we're probably going to do it again. We're going to have we have a lot to add to it as you know, kind of an update and refresh it. But I think we'll probably do 100,000 copies this next printing, and so we'll probably do that in the next year or so, or. I'm working on two more books I got to finish before we start that project, but I think it's time to update that one. But uh, very, very proud of that. It started out with 5,000 pages. <laughs> it was 5,000 pages, and everything was very crisp and tight. And W.B. Saunders says we'll never sell them 5,000 pages because you know the book was that thick and there was so much information in there. And people, it would cost $50,000 a book. They said, "Okay, not going to do it." And so they, they edited it down without losing any of the meaning. All the pictures were there, the pictures stayed in, of the microscopic slides and that kind of stuff, the various diseases where it was pertinent. Now, if you can find them used and beat up, you might get one for 400 bucks, but usually they're averaging around 900 to $1,000. Uh, if you get them in pretty good shape, they'll sell for 4,500 to um, 9,000, 10,000. Brand new, if they're still in the box, not open, they sell for $25,000. Because to redo that project would cost over $1 billion. They looked at that a couple of years ago. They were going to redo the project. So I said, I'll volunteer. I'll, I'll supervise it for nothing. I'd like to redo the project, okay, 30 years later. So I won't charge anything. I'll just do it just to be doing it and be involved. And they called me in six months and said, okay, sorry, Wallach. Uh, we can't do the project. Why? What's the matter? Well, um, we did a, an estimate of the cost of the project. To get it done in 10 years, it would cost $1 billion today. 
It was only $25 million back then. So they'd rather just spend $25,000 on your thesis than to redo it for $1 billion. What I'm going to talk about tonight is um, the biggest cause of death in Americans, cardiovascular disease. That sounds pretty simple, but I want to precede those remarks with two statistics. Statistic number one goes back to 2004. The Center for Disease Control, some of you have been with me for a while, you've heard that before. Center for Disease Control, that government agency that tracks diseases and plagues and epidemics and all that kind of stuff. What they said in 2004 was that our children would be the first generation of Americans that do not live as long as their parents, according to the Center for Disease Control. That indicates a catastrophic failure of the health care and medical system. You only point in one direction, the health care and the medical system. They are the cause of this, where the government is saying our children will be the first generation of Americans that do not live as long as their parents. So our goal is to save as many as we can. And we can either build an ark or or, or we can try and circumvent the problem. I think we'll help more people by circumventing the problem. Uh, just a couple of years ago, Johns Hopkins, very famous medical school from Baltimore, Maryland, you've all heard of Johns Hopkins, very famous. They came out and said that and they had done, they've been looking for 20 years for the top 20 causes of death in America and that kind of stuff. And just a couple of years ago, they came out and said, the number three cause of death in America is medical doctors. Simple mistakes in their workplace Simple mistakes in their workplace. Each year, medical doctors in their workplace kill 251,000 patients. Every four years, they kill one million patients from simple mistakes in their work, workplace. How many businesses could stay in business if they killed 251,000 of, of their customers every year? Zero. Yeah. Now, the reason they survive is they have insurance. So the insurance pays off the relatives to keep their mouth shut, and their their society lets them keep their license and they just keep on going and keep killing more people. Now those are two horrible statistics. I just, I mean, this is in the front page of the New York Times and yet people continue to go to doctors. I just love my doctor. He told me to take two aspirin a day and my headache could go away. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of Americans. Cardiovascular disease starts in the intestines because you need nutrients, and we'll get into some of those nutrients in a minute for the cardiovascular system, but if you're eating gluten, you cannot absorb them because you're damaging your intestine, and if, you're, if your ability to absorb drops down below 3%, no matter how much supplements you're taking, it's all going out in the toilet. So part of the deal is, you know, for 100 years, the medical system has been telling everybody, eat more whole grains, they're good for you. Bam, you're dead because of gluten. Wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Wheat, barley, rye, and oats, okay? Now, what was the breakfast of champions? Wheaties. Wheaties. Why do you think all the athletes die so young? Wheaties. What about Quaker oats? Getting a picture? Okay, now, you've got, to, you've got to get rid of all that. Pancakes, waffles. You have to live like an Asian, live on rice and sweet potatoes and vegetables and fish and poultry and red meat's fine, but you can't have wheat, barley, rye, and oats. You can't eat the European grains. If you like beer, that's fine, but you gotta drink Japanese, Korean, and Chinese beer because they're made from rice. All the European and American beers are made from wheat. This is drop-dead serious problems. We're killing our kids by giving them all these grains. Vegetarians kill more people now than communists. Then, Oils, which everybody said is good for you, they taste good in salad dressings and mayo and all that kind of stuff. Don't put mayonnaise on the sandwich, okay? Because oils oxidize and turn into trans fats, heterocycumines, and acrylamides. Oils, heated oils, whether it's fried or even room temperature in salads as a salad dressing, cause plaque in your arteries. Cholesterol does not cause plaque in your arteries. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. That's an absolute lie. Your biggest enemy is oil. Turns into trans fats, heterocycumines, acrylamides. I found that out in, let's see, it was 1969. I was on that big project with NIH, did my 20,000 autopsies, and two of them were wild sheep from the Atlas Mountains of North Africa, north of Morocco. And they were only in, in America for two months. They died three days apart. 
when I did the autopsy on them, they died from 98% blockage of their coronary arteries with plaque. I had to sit down a minute. Now, where were these sheep getting cholesterol? They're not eating eggs. They're not eating red meat. They're not eating butter. So I gathered up the food they were eating, which was mixed grains. They were giving them grass clippings from the zoo. They were giving them hay. So I got it all together. We, we looked for pollution. We couldn't find any pollution or contaminants, uh, chemical contaminants in the food. But we did find the acrylamides and the oxidized oils. But they didn't, in the recipe, they didn't add any oils. So where were the heterocyclamines and acrylamides coming from? Where were the trans fats? You're exactly right. The mixed grain was stored for two years in a metal 55 gallon drum in a metal barn. And during the summer times, you get over 120 in there. And it oxidized the wheat germ oil. And the wheat they were feeding those, those sheep oxidized, turned into trans fats, heterocyclic and acrylamides, and caused the plaque in the artery. I spent six months researching those things and figured it out, got it published. I tried publishing it in a cardiology journal here, medical journal here in the United States. They wouldn't take it. They said, well, like, you're out of your mind. That's a human disease. Why would sheep? I said, That's, that was my question, but I figured it out. No, we won't publish it. I couldn't get it published in veterinary journals. They said, well, we called the medical guys because this, med- this is a human disease. And they said, you're crazy and we can't publish it. So I got it published in a Danish pathology journal. <laughs> okay, so it did get published. Then you have to appreciate when you can't absorb these nutrients, many of them are minerals. Now, I have to tell you that hemorrhoids, varicose veins, and aneurysms are caused by deficiency of the same <coughs> nutrient. That same nutrient deficiency causes white hair. I see some people with white hair in here and silver hair and salt pepper hair, gray hair. These are people who are in great risk of having aneurysms, okay, and varicose veins and hemorrhoids because that one nutrient deficiency causes all those problems. Then I did 1,700 autopsies on kids under the age of 10 who died of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart disease. That's that heart attack that young athletes die from. 1,700 <coughs> autopsies in that project. These kids all died from this heart disease. In America, 25,000 under the age of 20 die each year in America from that sudden heart disease caused by deficiency of a single mineral. When I did that autopsy thing, I was actually looking for something else. I already knew what that was caused by. So I was looking for cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, and Sutherland death syndrome. In the 1,700 autopsies of the kids that died of that heart disease, that heart attack, 35% had cystic fibrosis, 100% had muscular dystrophy, and 200 of them under the age of one year of age had what would be diagnosed here in America as crib death or sentiment death syndrome. We used that information to sue the FDA and we got a ruling in our behalf to put that nutrient in and I've been trying for years to get all 60 minerals in. They're just too complicated, too complicated. This time I just tried that one nutrient. And the federal judge gave us a ruling in our favor, April 16, 2013, that all manufacturers of baby formulas had to have that nutrient in it. Now, for up until that time, we actually came up with Kids Toddy, which had that nutrient in it, which is a liquid multiple for babies. And we'd have them put that in the baby formulas because the baby formulas only had three, three minerals. You need 60. All these babies are dying of all this stuff. The doctors are saying, oh, they're dying of all these these genetic diseases. No, which is simple mineral deficiencies. So to make a long story short, three months after that ruling by the federal judge, the FDA gave them a high and a low. You can't get below this because you won't get any result. You can't get above this because we don't have any experience above this. And all these manufacturers of baby formulas, including things like um, Infamil, Similac, why is it? They named that baby formula Similac because it lacks everything. But once they put that nutrient in there, three months later, the Charlotte Observer, which is the main newspaper in Charlotte, North Carolina, they came out and said big headlines in the front page. I mean, like Third World War type headlines, bold, black, big headlines, said, we don't know why, but sudden infant death syndrome has vanished in North Carolina. Well, that's because we put that mineral in the baby formulas. Three months later, the state of Missouri came out and said the same thing. We don't know why, but sudden death syndrome has vanished in Missouri. Three months later, every newspaper in America came out and said, we don't know why, but the rate of, of sudden death syndrome, SIDS, crib death, has reduced by 85 to 95% in every state.
because that one nutrient was put in the formula. These are the sort of things we do. So let's get to congestive heart failure. You all heard of that. That's caused by deficiency of a single vitamin. And uh, Ryan was interviewing me today and he was asking me some of these things. And I'd almost forgotten that um, the porpoises in captivity were all dying of congestive heart failure in the zoos and, and in the, uh, this is back during the 60s. When I just came back from Africa. They were telling me, well, yeah, we had three dolphins for about two years and they, they all died of congestive heart failure. Another zoo would call me, another zoo would call me. They called me from Europe in London. Why are all our dolphins and whales dying of congestive heart failure? Well, because it's caused by a deficiency of a single nutrient. Well, it turns out the fish they were feeding them had an enzyme that destroyed that nutrient. Smelt. They were feeding them smelt. It has, it has that enzyme in the muscle. At every zoo that began to feed, they said, well, feed them smelt, they're cheap. And, okay, and so as soon as they all started feeding them smelt, they all died of congestive heart failure. That must have smelled bad. Yep, it did. Very good. Oh, you're okay. So at any rate, we, we changed their diet, got them on the 90 essential nutrients, and it instantly stopped the deaths in the dolphins and the whales in the zoos. Huh? And so the same thing is true with us. One of the things that actually puts pressure on that vitamin, let's say you're taking a modest amount of that vitamin, if you eat a lot of sugar, that sugar inactivates your body's ability to use that vitamin. Okay, it makes that enzyme that destroys that vitamin stronger. So sugar is one of your worst enemies okay, when it comes to congestive heart failure. And when it comes to birth defects and babies are born with holes in their heart and all kinds of heart problems and this, that, and the other, that's caused by mama missing these nutrients during pregnancy when the heart is forming. It's not a genetic thing. AFib. AFib is not a heart thing. It's see, cardiologist killed that uh, congressman from... Elijah Cummings. Elijah Cummings, where he was from? Uh, Maryland. 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 Yeah, okay, Elijah Cummings. He was 68 years old. He'd been in the Congress for, what, 30 years or yeah. 40 years or some long-time congressman. He had AFib, and they opened him up, and they took a soldering iron, heated it up, and tried killing parts of his heart muscles so that it wouldn't run fast and beat irregularly because they thought it was a heart problem. They killed him on the, on the surgery table. A congressman, they killed him with the wrong treatment because he had a back problem. The nerves that control the rate and rhythm of the heart are the first four thoracic spinal nerves. When you have degenerative disc disease, your vertebrae T1, 2, 3, and 4 get closer together and smash the roots of those nerves, causing AFib. Now also, if you have osteoporosis of the skull and is squeezing the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, vagus nerve does many things. When, when you squeeze the vagus nerve, you get COPD, that chronic dry cough, unproductive cough, that's osteoporosis of the skull, squeezing the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. You also get AFib. So you can have AFib from osteoporosis of the skull, squeezing the 10th cranial nerve, and also from degenerative disc disease, squeezing those four nerves between T1, 2, 3, and 4. So you can have two causes of AFib, but none of them are from the heart. Also, you can have what's called gastroparesis. It's extremely painful belly pain. And they can't figure it out, but it turns out it's that vagus nerve goes all the way down into your belly and controls your intestines and your, and your stomach. And they'll put these endoscopic tubes down your throat and look around there looking for an ulcer, that kind of stuff, or cancer in your stomach, take samples and things. They can't figure it out. Say, so, well, the only way we can guarantee we can take away the pain will just take your stomach out. Well, that's the wrong approach, right? And so I'm telling you all this. Oh, there's one other thing I had to back up. I missed one. Okay, how many of you have heard of red blood cells? <laughs> how many of you heard of white blood cells? How many of you heard of platelets? Okay, now all of those are part of the cardiovascular system, right? They're just the mobile cells that carry oxygen and food and stuff like that, right? So, uh, they do things, but they require 90 essential nutrients. Your bone marrow makes red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So your bone marrow is part of your cardiovascular system. Because if you're not giving all the nutrients necessary to your bone marrow, you can't make red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. People say, oh, you have an autoimmune disease. Uh, your platelets aren't there anymore. Really? Uh, do you have any skin problems? Yeah, I've got eczema and dermatitis. Well, Margie, what does that mean? Gluten. Gluten alert, gluten alert, gluten alert. So even if you're supplementing with minerals, you can't absorb them, so your bone marrow is still without the minerals. Okay, well, what about white blood cells? Huh? You know, what if you get a, you know, a pneumonia or something like that? Your white blood cells go up, they say, no, they, they can't figure out why. They say, I must have a bad 
uh, genetics for my immune system because I can I can get any disease you can think of and my my blood cells never pay attention they never increase or never go to the local place they have nothing okay well when you bleed how long you, well, if I nick myself shaving I'm bleeding for three days that's because there's no platelets because the bone marrow is not getting the nutrients it needs because you're on gluten and you can't absorb me if you're supplementing and you know people with these problems you know they put the pieces of tissue paper in their face and it's just bleeding through that all the time you know, your platelets aren't working so all that has to do with the cardiovascular system the doctors want you to think it's just your heart and arteries how many nutrients does it take for bone marrow to make red blood cells 90 oh my doctor said i just needed iron for my red blood cells no you have all the proper amounts of iron in your blood but if you're missing any one of the other 89 you're going to be anemic well my doctor says i have a genetic disease well what about sickle cell anemia it's called thalassemia it's called thalassemia in white folks same disease because it's not a genetic problem in black people I've seen sickle cell anemia in hummingbirds okay and snakes all kinds of vertebrates of every kind chickens and all kinds of stuff why because it's the deficiency of a single nutrient during incubation in the egg or during gestation in the uterus when the when the bone marrow cells are farming that make hemoglobin and mama's missing that stuff there's an injury and so it just keeps producing dysfunctional red blood cells. Doesn't matter what race you are, what species you are. So the cardiovascular system is a lot more complicated than just you know doing a heart transplant. And you guys are in a position to prevent all these problems and reverse all these problems. Now you think about that. Remember, the CDC says our kids will be the first generation of Americans that do not live as long as their parents. That's because doctors are giving out nothing but misinformation. Eat more whole grains. That's the worst possible thing you can do. Eat like an Asian. Rice and sweet potatoes, vegetables, fish, except for smell. <laughs> okay? And poultry is fine. Red meat is fine, but you can't fry it. You can't burn it. But just, well, I took iron. No, you need everything to make it all work because you're dealing with every tissue in the body as part of the cardiovascular system. So let's open it up for questions, a few questions. Yes, sir. Uh, three uh, three snack foods, I'll call them. Peanuts, raisins, sunflower kernels, and wild blueberries. That's four. That's four, okay. Uh, any of them good, bad? What's the... Uh, well, you said sunflower seeds, right? Sunflower kernels. Kernels, okay. Well, you got to watch it because they have oil in them, sunflower oil. If they're stored for any length of time. They've oxidized and turned into bad stuff. Same way with peanuts. Oils are dangerous. And oils are dangerous. They cause cancer and they cause plaque in your arteries. Also, peanuts have a fungus on them called aflatoxin. Uh, Ryan and I were talking about that today when he was filming me. And um, there's a very famous story. It goes back to the 60s when all the bears in the world in captivity were dying of liver cancer. Every bear in the world in captivity was dying of liver cancer. Polar bears, black bears, Kodiak bears, brown bears, sun bears pandas they were all dying of liver cancer when I came back from Africa to do my 20,000 autopsy study for Marlon Perkins and the NIH he gave me his personal list okay you're gonna do the project for NIH but since I got you the grant these are the 12 things I want well the first thing on there was all the bears in captivity are dying of liver cancer okay well it's not a genetic and I said well what do they think it is he said well they just say it's got to be a genetic thing in bears well, why suddenly after all these years <laughs> are every bear of every species dying of liver cancer. It can't be genetic, so don't tell me it's genetic. Okay, so what are they feeding them? Well, they're just, you know, giving them vegetables and bread and peanuts and stuff, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, they sell peanuts and people throw peanuts to them and they stand up and beg and people throw peanuts to them, kind of stuff. Well, there's a fungus that grows on peanuts called aspergillus, which produces a toxin called aflatoxin, which causes liver cancer. There's a mold that grows on bread, you know, this, people call it penicillin mold, but it's really not penicillin mold. It's uh, a actually this aspergillus. It's kind of green like penicillin, but it's not, it's aspergillus. So they're also getting from the, from the old moldy bread, which they would buy for 25 cents a loaf and feed it to the bears because one loaf of bread was 1,500 calories and they didn't have to give them all that meat and this, that, and the other, so they're just giving them two, three loaves of, per bear every day of moldy bread. So at any rate, so I said, okay, let's write a letter to all these zoos, because, I mean, we're talking 1960, we didn't have emails and stuff like this, so let's write a letter to all the zoos and suggesting that this is the problem and just have them 
change to dog food that's gluten free. Okay, it had to be gluten free dog food, dry dog food, and vegetables. And let's see what happens. Well, in 90 days, all of the deaths from liver cancer stopped, and there's never been another bear since the 1960s get liver cancer ever since. Hmm? So we save the dolphins by changing their diet. We save the bears by saving their diet. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out from the medical school there in New York City. I want them to give me how many, what percentages in the homeless people dying of liver cancer versus people, people who are in the middle class dying of liver cancer. I'll bet you the homeless people is many times higher because they're eating the old moldy bread the aflatoxin and the aspergillus mold. These are things you can control, and they're all in the books. They're all in the book, Rare Earthman Cures, Epigenetics. It's all in the book, Dead Doctors Don't Lie. It's in the book, Immortality. That stuff is in there. There's life-saving stuff in there. You know, I forget about these things, and I forget, oh, we were going over how many autopsies they've done, and I, I'm missing about 4,000. I said, where did, that, where, where did I do those? And we're driving over here, and it dawned on me, well, I spent two years in Africa, and the impala antelope were competing with the white rhino for the same short grass, and we were killing 400 of them to 500 of them a month so they wouldn't be eating the stuff that the white rhino needed. And we would give the meat to all the local villages so they were happy. It was against the law for them to hunt them, but we could crop them to save, save the white rhino. So I did autopsies on every one of them. I mean, we didn't do laboratory work without in the middle of the bush, but we did gross autopsies on all of them. You know, which ones had birth defects? Well, they had birth defects out in the wild because it's not a genetic thing, it's a nutritional deficiencies. Parasites, that's a sort of things in the intestines. You know, you get a roundworm that long, it's easy to see. You don't need to look under a microscope to find that one, and so forth. And so that was another 4,000 there, 1,700 in China. 20,000 in North America, okay, in the universities. Another 5,000 between University of Missouri, Iowa State University, Washington University, and, and also the um, uh, Yerkes Primate Center in Atlanta, worked for NASA. I get almost breathless when you think about all the things we've done to help save humanity. And of course, the medical doctors say just the opposite. They go, oh, don't listen to that Wallach, he's a quack, blah, 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 okay. <laughs> And so people choose poorly, and they'll listen to their doctor, and the doctor will kill them. Okay, anybody else have a question? Yes? What do you think about the GMO stuff, and is that much worse yet than... Okay, have you ever heard of crapola science? <laughs> <laughs> crapola? Yeah, crapola. Is that a university? Yes. <laughs> now, what, is, what does GMO stand for? Genetically modified organisms. Okay, see, now they're trying to blame all these illnesses on genetically modified food. That's crapola. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. You have to appreciate that mineral nutrients, which make up two-thirds of the 90 cents of nutrients we need, do not occur in a uniform blanket around the crust of the earth. They occur in veins like chocolate and chocolate of ice cream. They occur like gold in gold mines. Does gold cover the earth equally? No. There's a mine over here, 10,000 miles. There's a mine over there. Same way with coal, same way with oil fields, same with silver, same way with iron. They do not occur in a uniform blanket around the crust of the earth. I was able to prove after 20,000 autopsies in one project that there are no genetically transmitted diseases. There are no genetically transmitted birth defects. And so when, when doctors couldn't figure out and the environmentalists couldn't figure out why we're having all these problems, well, they're going to blame it on GMOs. It's a genetically modified thing. Well, that's why we're having all these problems. No, none of it is caused by GMOs. I get breathless every time I think about this, how badly they missed it. That our children will be the first generation of Americans that don't live as long as their parents. Doctors kill in their workplace by simple mistakes every year, 251,000 customers. When do you say enough is enough? Right now. Now. We have to take control. <laughs> And that's what you're seeing with longevity. People need and want the information. They have to be independent. Back when I was a kid, we didn't have electricity until I was nine years old. In those days, all the grannies 
use wood stoves. They didn't have electric stoves. And when Grandma had cravings, she had pica and cravings. Are you pregnant? You have cravings? No, I just have cravings. She'd take a spoon, go out in the backyard and eat clay and dirt. <laughs> Kids will eat dirt when they have cravings. They would use wood ashes. They would eat wood ashes. And they'd mix them in with their porridge or they'd put them in their drinks or they'd put them in their um, um, bread dough to stop the cravings. Wood ashes, which are minerals. Now babies, what, was, what, were, the, what were the beds called for babies 50 to 150 years ago? Cribs. Cribs. How many of you ever heard of cribbing? Okay, babies would chew on the rail of the cribs when they were missing those minerals and have cravings. And so they started putting fiberglass and plastic shields on the rails to prevent cribbing. Now, when you go into a horse barn and you see where the horses are chewing on the top rail of the stall they're in, they call it what? Cribbing. cribbing. Well, pike is another name. Cribbing is the common term for it. It's caused by mineral deficiencies. Now, why is it? I'll find out here pretty soon. In Santa Monica in California, they had 28 horses either die on the track or had to be destroyed because they broke legs racing on the track. I mean, you heard about that kind of thing going on? Yeah. That didn't happen before. Why is it happening now? Well, I'll bet you they changed their source of mineral supplements. Or maybe to save a little money, they stopped giving them mineral supplements. They just given them hay and grain. Well, there's gluten and grain and hay which only needs three minerals. And so the um, first thing I'm going to do is go in the barns and see if they're cribbing. And then I'm going to get hair from their mane and tail and do hair analysis on them. And I'm, gonna, you know, I'm sure they did autopsies on them, so I'll you know, go to the veterinary school and get uh, the results of the autopsies. With people struggling with drug addictions, what would be the best thing for them? Great question. Okay, very good. Minerals, very high levels of minerals, because cravings are tied to nutritional deficiencies, okay? And of course, uh, why did they take them originally? Did they have anxiety? Did they have depression? Okay, anxiety. anxiety. Okay, well, anxiety is caused by a mineral deficiency, caused by a deficiency of a single mineral. Talk therapy and all the tranquilizers and painkillers in the world aren't going to fix it because it's a mineral deficiency, and they need to get rid of all the gluten and all the bad stuff, right? And you have to appreciate all these people that have done mass murders and mass shootings. All these people who do terrible things to their family and their schoolmates and workmates in public places. All these people who right now have autism and all the various symptoms of autism. We have one million kids under the age of six that are already on psychotropic drugs for autism in America. One million right now under the age of six. And if everybody, if you have somebody in your family with ADD, ADHD, autism, anxiety, you get them on the minerals. Get them on the 90 cents of nutrients. Talk therapy and tranquilizers aren't going to cut it. And I'll, I'll end that statement with, I mean, you really need to, which I say, you really need to listen to some of my presentations uh, because I go into this in great detail. But the, but the one that I want to share with you is a, a, a medical doctor from South Bend, Indiana. In September of last year, he was late. He'd been practicing for 40 years in Indiana, had four clinics. People loved him. He didn't show up for a family meeting, so they sent his son to go to his house in Illinois, and sure enough, he was dead from a heart attack, 70 years old. Ulrich George Klopfer is his name, C-L-O-P-F-E-R. Well, after they buried him, a week later, you know, the insurance had paid off, and they had the house sold, and they, everybody met at his house, all the family had met there to um, divide up the insurance money and sell the house and get that money, divide up the cars and the furniture and all that kind of stuff. And one son's exploring the basement in the six-car garage in the attic, and he finds he finds 2,400 medically embalmed human bodies in blue plastic bags. 2,400. Now, I guarantee you, he was deficient in nutrients. So this is a very simple problem. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all. God bless you. We have a job to do to save America. Longevity is in a position to save America, and I'm very excited about this. Uh, Save as many as you can in your church, in your family, in your neighbors, your workplace. And that's what it's going to take. And uh, don't forget, we have tools. One of the heaviest questions people ask me is, well, I'd like to do this, but I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a pharmacist. And people are going to be asking me about diabetes and arthritis and Alzheimer's disease and all this kind of stuff. What do I do? Anxiety, what do I do? 
well, we have tools. We have CDs, DVDs, and books that tell you what to do. We have these kind of meetings, and these people have been with me. Char and Margie have been with me for, what, 29 years? For a while. Yeah, almost 30 years. And they know more than doctors. Okay? We have people been with me. For, uh, Lance, how long have you been with me? 17 years. 17 years. There you go. Okay, there you go. Wow. Well, let me start out uh, by saying that um, all birth defects are preventable. Uh, there's a small percentage of birth defects that are caused by infections with viruses and bacteria and fungus and uh, poisons and pharmaceuticals in the early stages of pregnancy. One of the most famous ones is thalidomide, which was a Australian drug for um, morning sickness in women in early pregnancies. And 10,000 babies in America were born without arms and legs because thalidomide interrupted the development of the limbs and the early embryo. All other birth defects are caused by nutritional deficiencies in the developmental stage of the embryo. There are no genetically transmitted birth defects. My thesis, $25 million study with the National Institutes of Health is in the Smithsonian Institute as a national treasure because I found there were no genetically transmitted birth defects and there are no genetically transmitted diseases. When it comes specifically to Down syndrome, Down syndrome obviously is caused by a birth defect at the moment of the first duplication. In other words, when the sperm fertilizes the egg, you're a one-celled human being, and then that one-celled human being divides into two cells. At that moment, if you're deficient in one particular mineral, the odds of being a Down syndrome is very high. And of course, up until the second month of pregnancy, I have success in reversing Down syndrome embryos by giving them other than 90 essential nutrients to provide that nutrient and other nutrients, of course. And we've done this in animals and we've done it in people. My most famous one was Lauren Knievel, um, Evil Knievel's niece-in-law. Uh, she came to me, she was two and a half months pregnant and diagnosed with a Down syndrome embryo. And she says, well, I'm not going to get a, a abortion. And I know I'm kind of late along the line here, but can you help me? I said, well, yeah, I think, you know, we'll give it a shot, but, uh, you know, I can't give any guarantees because I've never done one past two months. So in other words, we gave her the 90th century nutrients. Her baby's born perfectly normal. Of course, it was a famous story because of um, Lauren Knievel and Evil Knievel were very famous people. But the same thing is true with all birth defects, whether it's a two- and three-headed baby or it's a baby with a heart defect or hydrocephalocele, which is... Um, spina bifida of the brain, that kind of thing. Um, we have kids born with too many fingers, no arms. Um, we have kids born with uh, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, all these kind of things. These are all totally preventable. Uh, cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy are reversible even after the baby's born because they're nutritional deficiencies. They're not genetic defects. Obviously, when a baby's born without an arm, you can't give them vitamins, minerals, and regrow an arm. But um, this information should be taught in sixth grade about the time that uh, teenagers are going through puberty. Um, this should be taught very heavily. If you take the 90 essential nutrients, you can prevent almost all birth defects except the ones caused by viruses and chemicals and prescription drugs and so forth. And it'll give everybody's babies and grandbabies the best shot at being born normal. And whether you have a cleft palate or a cleft lip, and of course I have a very famous story about that, um, one zoo had a, a pair of arctic foxes and they had a litter of babies, and had 10 of them, and they were all born with cleft palate. And of course the general curator and all the keepers wanted to destroy the mother and father and all the babies because they were afraid it was a genetic problem. He said, whoa, 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 before you do that, let, let's uh, do something useful here. Uh, first of all, um, what did you feed the mother and father before they got pregnant? Oh, well, they're meat eaters, so we gave them horse meat. Okay. Did you give them any vitamins and minerals? No, they're meat eaters. We gave them horse meat. Well, that's why the babies were born with all with cleft palates and cleft lip because mom was missing things when the baby went from a flat disc into a tube. Okay. And they had a cleft palate, cleft lip. And that's, that's the cause. So I'm going to prove it to you. So what I want you to do is uh, take two of the males and two of the females, and I want you to hand raise them, bottle feed them, and I want you to keep them separate. And then when they're old enough to go through puberty, breed one of the males to one female, you know, to a sister. I mean, that's inbreeding as much as you can get and breed the other female to the brother. And it's inbreeding again. But I want you to give them dog food. And, and uh, I want you to give them uh, dog puppy 
formula and hand feed them the formula with all the nutrients in it um, uh, prior to um, them getting old enough to be pregnant. The others that you keep, I want you to let the father of these babies breed two of the females or more, two to four of the female babies, but you're gonna have to same way hand raise those with the puppy formula with all the nutrients in it. And then when they get old enough, um, you're gonna give them dog food, okay? It has to be gluten-free dog foods that can maximize absorption of the nutrients. And then I want two male babies to get old enough to be able to breed the mother and, and get her pregnant in breeding again. And let's see how many of the babies are born with cleft palate. Now, if it's, if it's genetic, I mean, it's gonna be 100% babies with cleft palate because you're inbreeding and inbreeding and inbreeding. And so it should be 100% cleft palate. So we did that. And nine months later, we totally had 100 babies from all those inbreeding couples and pairs. And they're all born perfectly normal, published. The big detail is in the book, Rare Earths Have Been Cures. I would say that's the place to see it. There's actually the picture in there um, of all those uh, kits uh, with the um, cleft palace and cleft lips. And then you get all the statistics and everything. So but this is true of all other birth defects. Cycloptic babies, one eye is in the middle of the forehead, two heads babies. We're talking about heart defects. We're talking about... Uh, Babies born with every kind of physical defect you can think of or biochemical defect you can think of, they're all nutritional deficiencies during the developmental stage of the embryo. Totally 100% preventable. Totally 100% preventable. And this should be the responsibility of fifth and sixth grade science teachers, pediatricians, OBGYNs, the government, schools, universities, um, in medical school, where the medical students should get taught this, nursing school, where the nursing students, schools get taught this, and also in the schools where p people get trained to be dietitians and nutritionists. We can eliminate all birth defects. None of them are genetic. Okay, Down syndrome occurs in animals. Down syndrome occurs in every race of human beings. Uh, it occurs in every type of vertebrate because it's a deficiency of one particular nutrient when the baby goes from a one-celled embryo to a two-celled embryo. And so this is a critical moment for that baby. But if you give them the nutrients as they're, in, you know, kind of like two-thirds of the way through incubation in, in eggs or gestation in uteruses, you can reverse the Down syndrome situation because we've done it many, many times, including, again, Lauren Knievel. So it doesn't matter the species. If you're a vertebrate, of any species, you have that deficiency at that stage uh, where you're going from a one-celled human being to a two-celled human being, there's a possibility of being a Down syndrome baby, regardless of species. And you have to appreciate that rickets are preventable by supplementing with vitamin D3. Now that doesn't mean that some kid that has rickets doesn't mean that they're less of a human being because we've learned how to prevent rickets by giving all peoples before during pregnancy, after pregnancy, uh, the 90 essential nutrients, which includes vitamin D3 and prevents rickets. It doesn't mean there's something bad about the kid with rickets. They're probably not gonna be a track star. And uh, if they're young enough with rickets, if they're just a couple of years old and have rickets, you can reverse the rickets. And of course, I have, I have a very famous story about the Down syndrome uh, with um, Ben and Wendy, which I think in earlier interviews we've discussed that, but it wouldn't hurt to mention them briefly again. Forty years ago, Ben and Wendy were born in Texas in different cities. They didn't know each other. Their families didn't know, know each other. She was born with Down syndrome and he was born with Down syndrome. Over time, their families, because of jobs and things, moved closer together. And 20-something years ago, they met each other and became good friends. I should tell you that when they were born, um, in each case, they were living in a town which we had a young Jivity associate, okay, Bob and Judy, and they were giving the parents the 90 cents of nutrients to give either directly or indirectly to those babies after they were born and had been diagnosed with Down syndrome. And so they were getting the 90 cents of nutrients from the day they were born. So one was being breastfed, mama was taking the 90 cents of nutrients, the other one's getting a bottle, a formula, getting the kids toddy. Uh, with that nutrient plus extra nutrients. 16 years ago now, 
in September of last year, 16 years, I was the best man at their wedding. They got married, and so this is the 16th year, and they're celebrating their 16th wedding anniversary. And if you look at them, you have to really look hard. You really have to know what you're looking at to see that they're Down syndrome because they stayed on those nine essential nutrients their whole life. And at that same time, we were celebrating their 16th wedding anniversary, and I had been the best man at their wedding. I, I danced with the bride, and we have a film of me dancing with the bride 16 years ago. Ben is retiring from his job after 25 years with uh, Texas A&M, and he was the head of one part of a computer department in the engineering department, the engineering school of Texas A&M. So he was as smart as you can get for a human being because he was taking the nutrients to make and, and eating all the right things, eating four eggs three times a day and staying away from all the bad stuff so he can absorb. And Wendy, uh, she is still working for Chick-fil-A as an international director of advertising. These are jobs that require a lot of brain power. These are jobs that require the ability to make decisions of great cost and, and value and importance. And they did it with great skill, even though they were born Down syndrome babies. That's because they avoided the bad foods and they took the 90th century nutrients and ate properly and gave their brain maximum nutrition, maximum supplement approach to function. And they're a classic example of the fact that Down syndrome babies can be supported nutritionally and participate in very high-end jobs, whether it's a university, whether it's in technology, whether it's in private industry. And so just because we say we can prevent Down syndrome babies, just because we can support Down syndrome babies, doesn't mean we are dissing or saying anything really negative about those babies. They're victims. And so somebody along the line should be held responsible for that because it was totally preventable. Early on, if they took the 90th century nutrients and stayed away from the bad stuff, they could participate in advanced high-tech society in, in a, a very, very productive way. So, you know, when people say, oh, well, you're dissing somebody, some kid with Down syndrome by saying you can prevent it. No, no that, absolutely not. That is definitely an incorrect view. Well, ingrown fingernails. Oh, so we go from Down syndrome, ingrown fingernails. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, when you have ingrown fingernails, we're talking about we're talking about uh, skin issues. We're talking about cuticle issues. We're talking about the raw materials to make healthy skin, uh, healthy connective tissue, and healthy nails. So it always comes down to they've got to get rid of all the bad stuff: no fried foods, no processed meats, no oils, no glutens, no wheat brought around oats, no sugar, and they need the 90 essential nutrients. And, and with that, it's telling you they've got a connective tissue problem. So they need to add to, I'd go with the biggest tool we have in our toolbox because it's kind of an early signal that there's things going wrong. And then of course they need to keep their nails uh, clipped properly and so the, the pressure is not put in the wrong place. And, and it, uh, if they need to, they need to go to a one, one of these places that do toenails and fingernails medically and so forth and keep them trimmed properly. And in a period of three to six months, everything will come right because this is a dynamic thing. Your skin is dynamic. Your nail beds, whether they're your toes or your fingers, are dynamic. They're constantly degrading or increasing in health depending on their nutritional flow and blood supply and so forth. Well, asthma? Asthma is uh, due to a deficiency of a single class of nutrients. Uh, almost always it indicates that this person has been very naughty and eating lots of gluten because this one nutrient is a very big clumsy molecule, very big clumsy molecule and it's one of the first things you cannot absorb efficiently when you have a gluten problem. It's one of the first things to go. And these same people who have asthma usually wind up with eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, rosacea, and they will be diagnosed with um, uh, things like uh, lupus. Uh, they'll be diagnosed with fibromyalgia. I've had one child, uh, Pastor Creflo Dollar's daughter, she was 11 and a half years old and she was diagnosed uh, with asthma. And Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia told Pastor Dollar that uh, she was born with a genetic form of asthma and she was going to die within a year, so she was not going to live to be 12. She was 11 and a half years old. They figured she's going to die before 12 because she's having like 10 crises a day of her asthma and they're barely able to save her a few times by giving her the medication. And so Andy Young, Andrew Young from the old Civil Rights Movement, um, he and Pastor Dollar called me. Now, this, you know, we're talking 30 years ago. Very famous is uh, Mayor of Atlanta, very famous, very wonderful man, Andrew Young. 
Well, well Andrew Young was a mayor of Atlanta, mm-hmm. and he is part of uh, Dr. King's army, of course, for the wonderful movement to free everybody, right? Andy Young was the guy who brought Pastor Dollar to me. And so I said, look, um, there is no such thing as a genetic form of any disease. And um, your daughter has very simple nutritional deficiency. And if you get on a, give her on a specific diet, everybody in the household has got to do the same thing. So there's no cross-contamination in the washer and the dryer and the food preparation surfaces and the beds and the couches. Everybody's got to be on the same diet. And then she needs to be on the 90 cents of nutrient for her body weight. And I believe we can save her and, and very quickly get rid of her asthma and her other symptoms of this problem. Well, Emory University said, and I said, well, they're incorrect. They're wrong. So you have two choices. You can follow what they say, let her have candy and stay up all night and watch TV and eat and whatever she wants and do whatever she wants, and she will die before she's 12, as they say. But if you change the diet in the household, get her on the proper diet, give her the 90 cents of nutrients, within weeks, her asthma will go away, and she will give you grandchildren. So you have to decide which route you're going to take. And they put their hand over the phone, and I heard them going, whoosh, 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 sort of thing. Came back on, and Pastor Dollar said, okay, I think we're going to try what you're doing. I said, yeah, you can still pray for her. There's no, <laughs> you know, God's medicine is the strongest medicine. So do what you can do uh, for that end, and then, of course, the nutrition and the diet and so forth. They just call me every two weeks and let me know how she's doing. And he dutifully called me in two weeks and said two words. She's cured! was the way he said it to me. He screamed it to me over the phone, two words. And 20 years later, at age 30-something, she'd given him grandchildren, beautiful. I have a picture of he and her when she's 30 years old. And she's supposed to die at age 12. So, there are no genetically transmitted diseases. There are no genetically transmitted birth defects. It's that simple. There's a bunch more questions here. Concussion? Post-concussion? Okay. Well, obviously, concussion can happen from falling down the stairs, being in a car accident, being hit in the head with a baseball. I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can get a concussion. And you get a demon swelling, maybe even some bleeding uh, inside the skull. So you're getting pressure inside the head. So you need to get rid of the pressure inside the head as well as relieve inflammation and so forth, which has already transpired. So when you have a concussion in the head, I like to, again, use the biggest hammer in the toolbox, get rid of all the bad foods, uh, use the healthy brain and heart pack, uh, eat three or four eggs twice a day per 100 pounds of body weight with soft yolks, um, need to have what we call Fucoid Z, which is an anti-inflammatory, uh, take uh, three of those twice a day per 100 pounds of body weight. I'd also take the synaptives so the brain cells can communicate with each other. We need to give them the ultimate daily classic tablets to get proper blood flow into the brain and proper exit of blood from the brain to carry off the edema and swelling in the brain. And we do have the, um, what we call RELAX, which is an anti-inflammatory um, sedative uh, for the brain. It's from our hemp FX. It's a CBD oil with about a half a dozen other herbs added to it and a pre-hormone added to it to relieve anxiety and things going on in the brain and to relieve the inability to sleep, which happens when you have a, a concussion and so forth, uh, allows and encourages sleep and rest. And of course, then we have the Soothe, S O O T H E, and Trauma Oil from Aromatherapy Oil Division. It's a blend of aromatherapy oils that actually relieve inflammation. Um, this I put four or five drops of the Trauma Oil, T R A U M A, into a teaspoon of the Soothe, S O O T H E. Mix that up really good and put it behind the ears, put it in the ears, put it on the back of the neck, uh, put it on top of the head, every place you can on the skull uh, to encourage reduction of inflammation and swelling. But could you speak a little bit on the reaction that the medical system has had to you, especially since 1978 and the whole cystic fibrosis story? Like, What, yes. what are some of the reactions and why um, has, the, has the medical establishment disregarded all, all of the successes in natural medicines and nutrition? Okay, well, you have to appreciate why doctors said there were genetically transmitted diseases. Um, when they didn't know an answer to the cause of a disease, the treatment of a disease, uh, they would say, well, you have bad genes. Because they wouldn't want to say, well, you know, I have no earthly idea what's going on here. We can try and treat some of the symptoms, but I can't guarantee a cure because 
I don't know what's going on. They're not going to do that. They say, well, you have bad genes and that's why you have this problem. And I might be able to treat some of the symptoms, but I can't deal with this because it's your body's uh, in a bad situation because of bad genes. And that got started, you know, over 100 years ago when they understood there were genes for, you know, for hair color, eye color, skin color, that kind of thing. And so they began to say, well, those genes do weird things and cause weird diseases. And so um, the first one that I came up with, which I showed very clearly, that it was a not a genetic transmitted disease, was cystic fibrosis. I was working at the Yerkes Primate Center um, for Emory University and NASA, and as a pathologist and a clinician. And I discovered the first non-human case of cystic fibrosis in a NASA monkey headed for space. It was six months old, and it was in a colony of 25 baby monkeys. It was one of 25. They're all about the same age. Every baby monkey had a different mother and father, which were not related as cousins or brothers and sisters, so they weren't related in any way genetically, except that they were monkeys. So I got permission because I actually had sent out slides of these tissues and I, to experts in cystic fibrosis pathology. I think this is cystic fibrosis. What do you think? They'd send me back a letter saying all of them from all these big universities and medical schools. Oh, no doubt about it. This is a classic example of cystic fibrosis. Well, then I, I called them up and said, well, hey, thank you for confirming and writing that this is cystic fibrosis. Uh, this slide came from a baby monkey. You have reconfirmed what I thought. This is the first non-human case of cystic fibrosis. And now we're going to be able to be able to have animal colonies with cystic fibrosis instead of the disease and do good things for these kids at a very rapid rate. And everybody was excited. I was literally in every newspaper in the world every day for three months until I got permission to do biopsies on the other 24 baby monkeys. So I did the biopsies in their, their lungs and their livers and kidneys. Sure enough, they all had cystic fibrosis. They weren't related to each other genetically in any way, shape, or form. So I got it all written up for publication and got, you know, I said I, I submitted for, to the university, Emory University, the medical school, to get permission to start building this as a colony of baby monkeys so we could study how to prevent and reverse cystic fibrosis because I had proved now that it was not genetic and they fired me. That's a pretty strong reaction. They fired me. I said, now wait a minute, we've got all the blood, we've got the um, baby monkey still alive. We've got all the other baby monkeys who have been diagnosed micro, you know, through biopsies. And you can redo everything yourself. Say, well, we're not arguing with the results of the microscopic studies and the blood tests and everything. But to say that this is not a genetic thing, we are arguing about that. I said, well, you look at it. Give me six months and I'll give you a thousand baby monkeys with cystic fibrosis. We can really study this. No, you're fired. Well, that's what drove me to realize how bad the medical science was. Okay, and I'll jump forward a little bit and remind you that the Center for Disease Control came out in 2004 and said that our children, our children, will be the first generation of Americans that do not live as long as their parents. That's because the medical system treats diseases they don't know anything about as a genetic disease and just treats symptoms as opposed to getting rid of the disease even though in animal industry we've gotten rid of the disease. Even though I've used the animal approach to treating these people with this disease and gotten rid of the disease. In fact, I did the same thing with mustard dystrophy and gave Jerry Lewis dozens and dozens of charts of kids that had come to me with mustard dystrophy, gave them the treatment for mustard dystrophy, which is called white muscle disease in animals, and show that they could be reversed and, and made normal. It wasn't a genetic disease. He got so excited, he took all these charts and tables to the Muscular Dystrophy Association. They immediately fired Jerry Lewis and shut down the telethon, which Jerry Lewis had been doing for 20 years to raise money for the research. Well, you notice in the past 10 years, you haven't heard much about cystic fibrosis. You haven't heard much about muscular dystrophy. You haven't heard much about cinnamon death syndrome because by putting these nutrients into the baby formulas, by court order, by federal court order, prior to that, the baby formulas did not have these nutrients in it, and the babies were dying of the nutritional deficiencies, and doctors were saying they were a genetic problem. We've eliminated hundreds and hundreds of different diseases in babies. And, you know, three months after the court's ruling on putting the um, nutrient in the baby formula, front page story, big story, Charlotte Observer. We don't know why, but Sendinvidin syndrome has vanished in North Carolina. 
Three months later, the state of Missouri said the same thing. We don't know why, but sentiment death syndrome has vanished in Missouri. Then three months later, total of nine months after the court ruling, every state came out and said, we don't know why, but the rate of sentiment death syndrome has dropped by 85 to 95%. Now, when you look at the statistics, only 2% of the babies that died of what would be diagnosed as sentiment death syndrome were in bed with their mother when they died. The rest of them were said that they suffocated in the blankets. Well, I redid a lot of those autopsies and guarantee you they died of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart disease. They didn't die from suffocation in their blankets. That's because doctors didn't know what was causing it. They thought the baby formulas were perfect, and that's why all those babies were dying of sudden and death syndrome and getting muscular dystrophy and getting cystic fibrosis and having asthma and all this kind of stuff because of the lack of nutrition and the lack of absorption. When you went around and told uh, the cystic fibrosis story and how you were fired for discovering the cause of care prevention of cystic fibrosis in, in rhesus monkeys, what was the reaction? Well, in the general public, they were just very angry with the scientific community. And I realized that I was going to have to do something more than just tell the story because then it was then left to the devices of people to go do their thing. And first, the thing they do, they say, well, well, I went to my doctor and told him your story, and they just laughed and said, oh, that Wallach is a quack. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Look in all the medical textbooks. It's a genetic disease. And so that's why I started coming out with CDs and DVDs and books. Started lecturing all over the place. To make a long story short, I bought a 20 year old clinic before two years before I graduated as a doctor had doctors legally run it with their licenses and I began to work there and do my residency in my own clinic and uh, in two years I got my degrees and licenses and so forth and began to work in my own clinic but not only did I carry on with the patients that they had I started putting on free meetings every Tuesday and Thursday night at the clinic I advertised on the radio paid three hundred dollars for a 30 second ad to come to this clinic and um Get a free health lecture. Ask all the questions you want about any disease you want. And so I began to get 300 people on a, th on a Tuesday night and a Thursday night coming to my free lectures. Most naturopathic physicians, even licensed in Oregon where I started out, they'd see 15 patients a day and they're overjoyed. Well, today, because of information in nine languages, audio cassette tapes, CDs, DVDs, books, I see 2 million pa patients a day in 50 countries. And because of all the tools, I have literally hundreds of thousands and even millions of people who will give the same answer to a question that I would give. Uh, that's what makes us different, that we can treat, prevent, and reverse 900 different diseases using nutrition, using diet. But you cannot get everything you need just by eating well. That's also misinformation. You must supplement. Plants only need three elements from the soil to make good seeds for the next generation. We need 60. So you could be 57 short. You must supplement to get everything you need. And people will say, oh, people didn't supplement 100, 200, 300, 500 years ago. Well, yeah, they did. They put wood ashes from their wood stoves into the gardens. If they had cravings, they would put wood ashes into their breakfast porridge or into their bread dough. Grandma would go out in the backyard with a spoon and eat dirt when she had cravings. Well, dirt's minerals. Ashes are minerals. And that's how people got their minerals. People did supplement. My grandmother lived to be 112. Well, you're not going to live to be 112 if you don't supplement because she was supplementing by putting her wood ashes into the garden. And she lived in a place that had lots of minerals in the soil. Trees only need three elements from the soil to make good seeds for the next generation. Well, guess what? If you just, you know, if you just eat things cooked on electricity and those bell peppers, the squash were grown on soil that only had three nutrients in it, that's the fertilizer, the commercial fertilizer, NPK, you're going to get all kinds of diseases because you're only getting NPK. Plants cannot make minerals. We require 60 minerals. I've been at a bunch of your talks where, and you always ask, is there any medical professionals in the audience? And usually you get some nurses and maybe, maybe a chiropractor, and sometimes there's a medical doctor in the audience. I've personally sat there with great curiosity waiting for the medical doctor's question. And many times I've seen them walk out halfway or right before the Q&A, or they just sit there and they don't answer, they don't ask a question. So I, I have not actually seen that many reactions to you from medical doctors because mm -hmm. they seem to just walk away from it. What are some of the reactions that you have gotten from doctors other than just ignoring you? Well, the strongest reactions, of course, occurred 20, 30, 40 years ago. We've been around a long time. Been on the radio for 25 years on 1,358 radio stations. I do interviews with very famous talk show hosts like Alex Jones and George Norrie and people like that. So it's not like I haven't been around. It's not like um, doctors haven't heard me before. 
And so if they do come there, they just want to see how many people are showing up. They want to see if any of their patients are there is really why they're there. They're not coming to learn anything from me. The strongest reaction I ever had was, gosh, this has got to be 25, 30 years ago. The first question during the Q&A was from a 30-year-old person who said, um, my mom has macular degeneration and she's been legally blind for eight years. Is there anything you can do to help her? I said, yeah, I can reverse that. This guy jumps up in the back of the room and said, Wallach, you're a GD liar. I said, well, who are you? He said, well, I'm a medical doctor. I'm an eye doctor. And that's all I do is see patients who are blind. I, I see patients by the hundreds every year who have been blind six, eight, ten years because they have macular degeneration. It's a disease of aging uh, and you can't prevent it. It's a disease of aging. It's, once you get it, you can't reverse it. And so you're a liar. I said, why don't we have a little wager here? He says, you're on. I said, now, since you're an eye doctor, I want you to pick 12 of your patients, 12 of your worst patients that have macular degeneration, they've been legally blocked six, eight, ten years. You give me those 12 patients, and what I want to do in this wager is we're going to put them on my diet, we're going to put them on my supplement program, and at the end of 90 days, if I could get half of them, if I could get six out of the 12 to be able to read 2020 in the 90 days, would you apologize in public, buy me a nice bottle of Cabernet, and take me out to Ruth Chris's Steakhouse for a big steak dinner. He said, you're on. I sit down and remember, you're gonna pick the patient, so there shouldn't be any question about the diagnoses. So the next day, he brought me 27 charts of patients who have been legally blind six, eight, 10 years. I said, well, why don't we take them all? I mean, you got 27 here, let's take them all. He said, okay. He said, I'll even do better. Since you're gonna take them all, I'll just say, if you could reverse one of them, if you can reverse any one of them in 90 days so they could read without glasses and they're legally blind six, eight, 10 years, I'll comply, buy, buy you that steak dinner at Ruth Chris's Steakhouse, I'll give you the bottle of wine, and uh, I'll apologize in public. I said, you're on. So I came out with my protocol, and of course, I spoke to each one of those patients myself. I didn't want to depend on that eye doctor doing that properly. Dr. Pugh, right? Uh, he, he's an eye doctor in uh, Salt Lake City. And to make a long story short, in 90 days, 25 of the 27 could read 2020. It took another two weeks for the other two to be able to get that far. And he complied. He bought me the bottle of wine. He took me out to Ruth Chris's Steakhouse. And at one of my big meetings with a couple of hundred people there, he apologized for calling me a liar because I could reverse macular degeneration. I've been doing it by the thousands every year since then. It's one of those things where that was probably the most direct in my face. I mean, they sued me a lot, but when it came to most of the time, it didn't get past the original court interviews and this and the other. The evidence that I had to support what I'm saying was so overwhelming. My degree in agriculture and I just bring in all the animal uh, dad also. And so they were just flabbergasted on you know the doctor's side. Well, you've never seen anything like that. Well, that's because you think you know everything. You discount the value of information that veterinarians have. And so you, know, you, you think there's sort of a third rule <laughs> uh, professional if they're a veterinarian. And you discount everything they say. Oh, go give some rabies shots to a dog kind of attitude. And so I'm both. I'm a physician and a veterinarian. And my patients, they laugh about it. And they say, Doc, you treat us like dogs, but we get better. Okay, let's take an Alzheimer's case. Ray McGregor. I can give you that name because it's a very famous story. He was diagnosed 11 years before I knew of him with Alzheimer's disease. The doctors treated him with pharmaceuticals. And he was from... Charlotte, North Carolina. His name is Ray McGregor. He's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and they began to treat him with pharmaceuticals for Alzheimer's disease, dementia. In three years' time, he got worse and worse and worse, went into a coma. He was in a coma for 11 years. He's being fed through a G tube with Insure, which is the worst possible thing to give him. I was amazed he lived that long because it was made from oil. No real scientific supplement program. And his sister came to me, really in distress, saying, Look, they're going to pull the plug on my brother Ray. He's at the point where he's almost at zero brain waves and he's been fed through the G tube. He's been in a coma for eight years or anything you can do. Okay, let's give him three or four eggs three times a day through his G-tube with soft yolk, soft poach, whip him up, put him in one of our shakes made with heavy cream, not water. And then we're going to give him the Healthy Brain and Heart Pack, a full dose of everything three times a day. We're going to give him the de-stress capsules through those twice a day, through the G-tube, you know, open them up and put the powder in the, in the stuff you're, in the food you're giving him through the G-tube. The Ultimate Niacin Plus. We're also going to give him the Ultimate Daily Classic Tablets grind them up and put them in the shakes going through the G-tube to make sure there's blood flow in case there's vascular dementia in there. Let's just go for it. 
Call me in two weeks and four weeks and six weeks. Well, she calls me in three days crying and weeping. And I said, uh-oh, we got a problem here. Well, I said, well, how's your brother Ray? And she just kept yelling on the phone, Ray McGregor, Ray McGregor, Ray McGregor. I said, well, tell me about your brother Ray. And she said, well, he got up this morning. He shaved. He got into his three-piece suit. He went back to work as a bank, as one of the vice presidents. He went back to his office and sat at the desk working. And all the people at the bank were freaked out because none of them had ever met him before because he went into a coma, was in the, in, in the nursing home before they even worked at the bank again. They were thinking, this is a weird way he's going to rob the bank. And so that's my most famous dementia story, Ray, Ray McGregor. Okay, I mean, and, you know, okay, so, and we deal with this all the time. Okay, another great story, true story, is we have a patient who was on dialysis for 25 years, and the last 10 years are on dialysis six days a week, because they hadn't peed in 10 years. They hadn't urinated in 10 years. They're on dialysis six days a week for 10 years. To make a long story short, we got them on the diet, got them on the 90 cents of nutrients, got them on the ultimate daily classic to get blood flow into the kidneys. And in two weeks' time, they dropped the number of dialysis treatments from six per week to now three per week because they started urinating. After 10 years, they're not urinating. And then in another six weeks, we are totally off of dialysis because didn't need dialysis anymore because the kidneys were perfect on lab tests. And that's because when you have kidney issues, when it comes to kidney failure, the blood test shows the kidneys are not filtering the blood. Almost always it's due to a different problem. It's not due to a kidney problem. Even though the tests show the kidney is not filtering the blood, it's due to the fact that the kidneys aren't getting the dirty blood because the arteries that carry the dirty blood in the kidneys are blocked. So we treat it as an artery problem as opposed to a kidney problem. Get rid of all the bad foods, all the inflammatory foods. Get rid of fried foods, processed meats, oils, glutens, wheat, brown, around oats, and sugar. Get them on the biggest hammer in the toolbox. And then we throw in the Ultimate Daily Classic tablets to support healthy blood flow through the blocked arteries and support healthy blood pressure. And almost always, almost 100% of the time, people will be able to get off of dialysis and go back to normal life. I do have MS stories, but MS is part of a class of diseases. I like to talk about Parkinson's disease, MS, ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, Huntington's disease, these sorts of things. You could throw in dementia into that same class because they're all biochemical deficiency problems. And in the case of MS, there's also an, an inflammatory issue added to it. That's why they have the plaques in there. By getting rid of all the inflammation, fried foods, processed meats, oils, and glutens, taking, again, the biggest hammer in the toolbox, the Healthy Brain and Heart Pack, uh, the ultimate daily classic tablets for circulation into the brain um, to get rid of the plaques for MS. We have them use these things like Fucoid Z, um, BTT 2.0 tablets uh, to get, help the white blood cells and, and the antibodies get rid of the inflammation in the brain. Make sure they're eating three or four eggs with soft yolks three times a day to repair the myelin or the white matter of the brain. And all those diseases will go away. All those diseases go away and people say, well, why do you give so many different products? Well, because there's eight different dementias. And when you have uh, MS, you could also have Parkinson's disease at the same time because they're all literally the same disease. The only difference is what part of the brain is more severely afflicted. And that's sort of an accident of chance, okay, because all parts of the brain do different things. So if part A of the brain is more severely affected, you're going to get diseases that are reflected, a reflection of a problem in those processes that the A part of the brain does. If you're looking at a disease that is found in the M part of the brain, just by dumb luck, that part of the brain was more severely afflicted, and so you get different symptoms. They give it a different name. And so that's why we have Parkinson's disease, MS, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. That's why we have Huntington's disease. That's, that's why we have all these different dementias, because of location, location, location. But they're all nutritional deficiency diseases.